I'm going to get started. So as I said, I'm Joe. I'm a senior technical evangelist uh, at Microsoft uh, for the audience team. So what is an evangelist? So an evangelist, really, what we do is we basically uh, beta test and use new technologies, improve technologies with companies. So again, when functions were new, we were already going out to customers and working with them and building proof of concepts uh, to test the technology, find the bugs, find what doesn't work specifically, report it back to the product teams. Um, I build a lot of fun demos, too, that like one I'll show you, and then you know, open source a lot of the code and, and we speak a lot at user groups. So it's a fun job. We get to code, learn new stuff, always on the latest technologies in the cloud, specifically around Azure, uh, and then and then demo it. Um, you can email me, you can follow me on Twitter and my GitHub. I will be tweeting out links uh, later for us to go to. Um, if you have questions on any of this stuff, always feel free to reach out to me. I'm terrible at email. I'm a little bit better on Twitter. Uh, and then in a previous life, I played in a heavy metal band, and I just recently became a father. So I got to keep a picture of my baby up there because I love her very much. So with that being said, uh, I'll kind of dive right in. So we're going to talk about exactly what is serverless. I keep hearing about it. Um, serverless at Microsoft, so specifically Azure Functions, and we're going to talk a lot about that. I'm going to go over the different tooling because a lot of that has changed specifically in the past couple weeks. We just had our big developer conference build two, yeah, two weeks ago, and we announced a lot of stuff around Azure Functions. Um, and then I'm going to show you some real-world examples. So um, I actually forgot about that. So I have, I've done a lot of real-world examples and customer projects and all the codes available, so I'll, I'll have links to all of that in here. Um, and I'll show you how we use, where functions worked well, where they didn't work well, the challenges you ran into. And then again, I'll, I'll end with uh, hopefully a pretty cool demo but we'll see, it may not be cool. So I'll start with this quote, which I have no clue who came up with this, but it's awesome, so I stole it. So serverless is to servers as wireless is to wired. So wireless internet still requires wires, but customers don't need to interact with them. So one of the, the, a question I get a lot when people ask about serverless you know, technology and architecture is, so you're saying there's no servers I'm working with? Well, of course there's servers. They're just behind the scenes. They're abstracted from you. The same way every single one of us here on our phones and our laptops are using the wireless internet, behind the scenes there's some server room here with a, a switch and a router and there's wires plugged into to a backbone. It's just we don't have to deal with them. So that's what serverless does for you. It's basically, it allows you uh, to focus on writing the code to do something very specific and, and uh, trigger that code based on an event or something very, very specific. And it only runs and it auto scales, does everything for you. And then when it's done running, it's gone. And there's no servers to manage, no anything. So that's where the whole serverless buzzword and architecture came from. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit of how we got there and why serverless is important. So Back in the day, I mean, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, or a little bit, maybe a little bit longer, you had on-premise. So if you were a company and you needed to stand up back-end services, APIs, whatever it was, you might have gone out, bought a bunch of servers, web servers, database servers, storage servers, whatever it is, and you might have had a rack in your office and you owned all that hardware, the bandwidth and all that. And whether you were, if you were preparing to, let's say, take on some holiday shopping traffic, and you estimated 10 million visitors were going to visit your website over the course of a weekend and do whatever, 5 million transactions, you had to prepare and pay for that worst case scenario. So you had all this hardware you owned, and it was there. And then if over the weekend you got you know, two customers, didn't matter, you still paid for all that hardware, and that, that's money you're out. So then we kind of moved into information as a service, or uh, sorry, um, infrastructure as a service, which should let you, where you didn't have to own the hardware, you could basically um, rent virtual machines uh, with any cloud provider, whether it was, again, Microsoft or, or AWS or Google or whatnot, um, to where you didn't have to worry about the hardware. You just rented capacity, and then you could scale it up and down, but you still had to manage uh, you know, server patches, security updates, all that type of stuff, but it was still a step in the right direction. Next evolution of that was platform as a service. And this is still very common and it's going to be around for a long time. And that basically abstracts it all from you to where um, you just write your code and your data. And then again, the servers are taken care of for you. Um, the updates, all that security is done, but it's running 24 seven. So meaning you, you get an instance of let's say a website and it's running 24 seven, as long as you put code on there and whatnot, it's always gonna be there available for you and it's running and you're being billed for it to be available 24 seven. So the next iteration is, I, I think the term they're, they're starting to throw around now is functions as a service, which is basically you just have your code out there 
and it's not running. It's n and you're not being billed for it. But when a certain criteria is met, whether it's someone hits an endpoint or a message is added to an event hub or an image is added into blob storage, then that piece of code fires off, does what it does, and then it exits and it's done. And you're only billed for those, whether it's milliseconds or a couple seconds or a couple minutes, and it's super inexpensive. So um, this really is, is allowing people to, you know, who have these ideas of, uh, uh, that they want to try of new apps, they can build them, you know, on a serverless platform and they're not incurring costs every month while they're waiting to see if this idea is going to take off. So that, that's kind of one big uh, thing about it. So, um, so again, the, it's the platform for next generation apps, which I was talking about to where, um, well, actually I meant to remove this slide. I'm going to skip over this one. So what exactly is, is serverless? So we talked about this, so abstraction of servers, so you don't ever have to worry about the servers whatsoever. You just worry about writing your code and, and, and managing your data. That's it. Event-driven instance scale. This is very important. So it auto-scales. If, so if right now I built this cool little fun game and it's a serverless, uh, the back end is all serverless, and I have 10 people using it, and tomorrow I have 10 million people using it, I don't have to worry about it. This, the serverless at, um, architecture automatically scales up multiple instances or thousands of instances to handle all that traffic. And then as that traffic decreases, it goes back down. So you're only paying for what you use, which is a big part of it. And it's one less thing you have to worry about. And then again, the micro billing. The billing as with everything in the cloud is a little confusing, but it's sub-second billing. I think you're billed for every execution of your function times how long it ran. And I think you get the first million executions for free. It does change from time to time, but it's super, super inexpensive, which is great. Um, so why is that an advantage for you? DevOps productivity. So much, much faster uh, development life cycles, allowing you to uh, build something, get it out there, and it's just, it's much, much quicker. Um, you could focus on the business logic. So uh, not solving technical problems of, of putting things together. You just, you can focus on items that are core to your business. And the most important one is if you're, again, building an app, um, use the financial services market as an example, you know, time to market in that industry is everything. So you don't want to take a month to build something or six months. If you could rapidly prototype something and have it out there in a couple of days, that could mean real revenue or you, you know, beating the next competitor, which is great. So those are some, uh, some high level things about um, functions. I'm going to kind of start getting a little bit deeper into it and see, uh, you know, to tell you a little bit more about specifics of it. So we have a couple different flavors of serverless. So the only one I'm really going to be focusing on today is functions. And, um, you know, with functions, you have very advanced developer tooling, you have bindings and triggers, which I'm going to get into, which are the core of it. And then it's open source. So not only um, is the actual, you can use any open source language or technology with it, uh, the actual functions runtime and everything you're going to see here, we open source it. So if you want to contribute to it or you want to contribute to the tooling, you can do that. Um, as some of you may know, Microsoft's made a, a huge shift in the past couple of years with, uh, with Satya as our CEO. And we are, I think, the largest contributor to open source as it is right now. And, you know, so all this we have out there is, is, is open source and available to you. Logic apps, I'm just going to just, the only time I'm going to talk about logic apps, these are cool uh, because they are serverless as well and they don't require code. They're, it's like a visual designer. So you can literally drag and drop that if something happens, you can connect, let's say, to Salesforce and say if, if this event happens in Salesforce, uh, then connect to Twitter and tweet this out type of thing. Or if someone uh, tweets at me on Twitter, you know, automatically reply back or retweet them and stuff like that. So we have over 100 connectors. It's really cool. And with logic apps, it's, it's a lot of drag and drop, no code. And then if you want, you can fire uh, an event off with a logic app and then chain it to a function, which is cool. So they kind of go together hand in hand. But today specifically, we're going to dive into functions. So we have that platform. And again, and then you add to that, you have your data storage, messaging, all those gateway connectors I was telling you about, artificial intelligence and bots, all that stuff you can easily link into here. Um, I have a demo where I'll demonstrate that. And then as far as development goes, uh, you have IDE support, so you can use Visual Studio Code. Uh, now you can use Visual Studio, which is great, and you can actually debug it. So that was a huge issue when serverless and functions and even on uh, AWS came out. I think they still have issues with debugging, um, but you, there was no uh, 
efficient way to, to write code, debug it. You, you had to like, when I worked with a partner to, to debug, I had to push to production. I had to write some code, check it into GitHub, see how it ran in production and like, oh, doesn't work. Let me pull that code back down and not a very efficient way of doing things. Local development. So you could build everything locally, which is great. That's what I do. Um, test it before deploying it. And what's even cooler is that you can test and build your functions locally and it could fire off of events happening in the cloud, which is awesome. So you could have cloud storage somewhere and you could ha drop, have a customer drop an image or a, a CSV file that needs to be imported in cloud storage and you can trigger off of that on your local machine, which is really, really neat. And then verbose debugging. That's really this, the same as debugging, but we really give you very detailed debugging, allowing you to troubleshoot and rapidly um, basically develop and, and fix your application if there's an issue. So that being said, I know it's a lot of information. I um, want to talk to you again about Azure Functions and, and really get into uh, the, how the programming model works, specifically uh, bindings and triggers, uh, and then we'll talk about the tooling. So the two main languages, well, let me, let me back up here. How many people uh, in here develop in C Sharp? Good amount? Oh, wow, most of you. And so Node.js, anyone? Okay, so good, good amount. So in the States, so I'm, I'm from the U.S., uh, based in South Florida, Miami, like Node.js is insanely popular. I'm a C-sharp guy, but um, so I usually, so in my talks, I'll, I do both, and I, I'll do it here, but that's good to see uh, that you guys do a lot of C-sharp. So this is an example. I know it's a, a little hard to read. I'll, I'll actually bring up uh, live code and, and make it larger in a few minutes, but this is an example of a very, very simple function. And then, so what you have here is you have the trigger itself of how you're going to trigger it. So that's right there. In this case, it's an HTTP request message, meaning this, this function set up on an endpoint. Someone's going to hit it with an HTTP request message, and then it's going to fire off. Then the next thing it's going to do is then when it fires off, it brings in these inputs, these bindings. So in this case, I'm bringing in um, a list of image text from an input table. So in this case, an Azure storage table. And then I'm bringing a cloud blob container, my input container. So I'm probably taking an Im uh, image text and an image, and then the log is just included as an input as well. And so it fires off, it brings all these items in. And so here's one thing that's important to note about the inputs. You're not gonna see anywhere in the code me go and connect to an Azure storage table or go and connect to the Azure blob storage. That's all set up behind the scenes and you literally reference it with just that one line of code. So it's, it makes it much, much easier to use. And then basically I'm gonna output after I'm done with my code, an HTTP response message. So status 200 and maybe um, if I wanna include a message or whatnot, um, or the result of what happened. And then I'm, I'm returning it down here. And then what we have is separately a file called functions.json with the actual bindings. So on the top there, you see the actual trigger binding. Okay, so I'm, tri I'm binding it to an HTTP trigger and it's coming in. And then I have two output bindings. Or I'm sorry, I have another output binding, which is um, I'm outputting an HTTP message and the name of the object, we're calling it RES. And then one of my other input bindings, that's the table that I'm going to be pulling data from. And that connection is the connection string I'm using. That's how it connects. It, it doesn't need to use an SDK, set up a connection, authentication, all that stuff. Literally just pulls it from there. And then... I can reference them inside my code. So literally, I'm just saying var query from image text in input table, select image text. So I can already start querying it from the very first line of code. And then um, I'm looping through on this one here. And I think what I'm doing is I'm just combining the images. It's, oops, let me back up. It's just an example. So you have your trigger, your inputs that come in, you run your code, and then it goes to the outputs. That's kind of the model. So again, trigger, inputs, code, outputs. And, and the whole point is that you just have each function do something small, something quick, and then it exits and it's done. So with triggers and bindings, you have a bunch of different ways to trigger, uh, and you have a bunch of different inputs and outputs, and this is always being updated. So let me see, I can see this better here. Give me one second. So, so you can trigger based on schedule. So you could set this up like you would... Um, uh, a cron job to where you want it to run every 15 minutes, every day, every third Sunday. So for example, I use this, I have an internal dashboard I built for the team I'm on to where every Monday morning at 5 a.m. it sends out like a list of highlights from like cool stuff we did from the week before. And I just have a trigger where every week it goes in 5 a.m., boom, pulls the data, combines it, sends it to SendGrid and I'm done. And it's really simple. Um, we talked about you can call it through HTTP. 
blob storage, which is one of the most popular ways to, to, that they're triggered. So an example of this is I worked with a partner on a mobile app to where every time on the mobile app someone wanted to upload an image, we just uploaded that image into blob storage and we used the function to watch that container. And every time a new image showed up, we pulled that image, we actually looked for faces in the image, I'm sorry, using um, uh, uh, cognitive services mapped where the faces were in the image and then did an intelligent crop to make sure that when we cropped that image, uh, it didn't crop someone's face, which was pretty cool. And it was just a series of two or three functions. And again, if people aren't uploading images, he's not being billed, which is great. Um, off of event hubs, uh, you know, uh, queues, so storage queues, service buses use as well for very large scale projects. We use service bus um, on a project we just did to help uh, the missing children of Canada society and I'll share that code as well because all that's open source. And then your bindings, then what, you can trigger them those ways but then you can bind on the input and the output um, storage tables, uh, SQL tables, no SQL databases. So now document DB is called um, Cosmos DB, and if so, if you use Mongo, it's, it's our version of NoSQL. Push notifications, Twilio, SendGrid. So the demo I did earlier today with Costa Farms and the IoT solution, I was just pushing a JSON object to Twilio and boom, it takes care of everything and I get it on my phone. I just had to put an API key and that's it. Um, and then also you can output and input from blob storage, which is a unique one. So I think this is now I have this a little bit larger. So, this is the Node.js version. So I'm not a Node.js expert, but it's, it's very, very similar here. So um, the function.json is exactly the same to set up all your input and output bindings and your triggers. Uh, so in this case, it's a queue trigger. We're waiting for um, a message to show up in the uh, output queue. And then when that message comes in, oh, that's the connection I'm using. So that's all I have to do to connect it to it. The item I, I can uh, query is my queue item. And then basically I'm just saying if my queue item in one of the fields I'm sending in is API ID and all this stuff, you know, then basically do my work and so on and so forth. So that's it. Literally to connect to the queue and, and grab the next item, it's, it's all kind of done for me. And then it does my work. And then when I'm done, I have context.done. So, um, and all these examples too are up on our GitHub page. We have like about 75 different Azure function examples. So I think I have the same thing in C-sharp, which we already went over, but this one, hold on one second. There we go. So the same thing in C-sharp. Um, so this is similar to just what we just went over, but larger. Um, important thing to note, you'll see this is a CS CSX file, so it's a C-sharp script file. So it's not a full um, C-sharp class, but with the tooling, you can now use full C-sharp classes, and I'll go over that kind of, uh, towards the end, which is great. But same type of thing. We have um, what our bindings are going to be for the image and then what we're going to output to. And then we do our code. In this case, we're building an image and we're outputting it back to blob storage. I think we're just resizing it here. That's it. It's as simple as can be. So this is the typical uh, work pattern uh, for a, a function, which we talked about. So you have your trigger. Um, again, and it could be any of those web hooks, uh, any of those services that you can bind to, which again, if you're binding to an internal Azure service makes it very, very simple. So, that, and then you have an input binding. So the trigger fires it. Optionally, you're bringing something in via the input. You have your code that you've developed. Um, it executes, you know, and, and computes, and then you out, it outputs that output binding. And then separately, you can, you know, monitor with application insights for those who haven't used application insights. Um, it's a very cool tool to where you can monitor like how many milliseconds it's taken or seconds each execution to run. Um, you can add extra application insights into your code, so into each method and function. So if one is specifically taking too long, you can go and troubleshoot that. Very, very cool tool. And then you can develop locally. That's my personal favorite feature because when they first re released this, you had to develop it all in the portal online and it was very slow. Now I do everything locally. Um, okay, so some examples, um, so some usage patterns. So uh, Brownfield um, used as an integration scripting tool, typically for enterprises and large uh, ISV. So integrate, maybe transform data from one source to another, but only when that new data appears. Um, Greenfield used for backend creation, typically startups or smaller ISVs. So again, that um, mobile app I mentioned that did the image processing, they're like a small, um, startup that it's like an Instagram style app for fishermen. And so they use a lot of their backend service, um, 
a lot of their back-end services are serverless because it saves them a ton of money and it makes it very easy for them. And then IoT. So um, I did a great example before, but basically you can use it a lot in IoT implementations to watch event hubs, only fire when certain conditions are met, um, or fire off other messages to IoT devices when conditions are met. So lots of different uh, uses there, which is great. So I'm going to go through some examples of typical applications we're seeing customers use, okay? And the goal here, again, is I hope you look at some of these and go, wow, I, I think I could use that and it could save me some time and make me look like a rock star and be awesome. So, um, so timer-based, which we talked about, you could have it run every 15 minutes, find and clean and valid data in a table. So we did the same one for that same app to where we have it run every night and purge expired refresh tokens. Um, and again, he just only gets charged for the 30 seconds it runs at night. Uh, event processing, so again, we talked about that one. So a file is added to blob storage. Um, in this case, it might be a CSV file. We then loop through that CSV file, import that data into data rows, and what did I just do there? So oh, into rows, and then um, maybe then you surface that in Power BI or some other front end dashboard. Uh, software as a service event processing, so you can have it when a file is saved to OneDrive, it triggers off um, a function and then we can use the graph API to, to analyze the content and then, um, oh, and generate new Excel sheets. I haven't actually seen this one. Um, and then serverless web architecture, which I'm going to demo later, I have a cool little app I built um, that uses that. So basically you have a page um, and it calls a webhook and then it creates um, an ad or a profile based on the information, and then you return the completed page, all without like a, a traditional backend. So very, very cool stuff. Uh, and then mobile backends, which again, photos taken and a webhook is called. We store it in blob storage. Another function is triggered, which then processes and scales those images down. But again, it only fires when it needs to. And then um, finally, uh, real-time stream processing. So. You could basically, the way this is used in IoT is you could have all these devices, you know, sending millions of events into IoT Hub and then Stream Analytics could process it and sort certain events into different buckets and then you can fire off Azure functions based on those events. And it's a very efficient way of doing it and it makes it uh, very easy to do. And again, at the end, you can then use like one of the functions to archive every single event into, uh, into SQL, which is great. Okay. okay, so proxies. This feature's in beta, but it's a very important feature, so I, I definitely wanted to talk about it, and I, I, I'm going to demo this as well. What this lets you do is, so normally when you create a function, you under the hood, a function does run as a web app or on the same type of service, um, but like say you um, create an HTTP trigger. We're going to create you some custom weird URL for it or whatnot. Um, what proxies let you do is it lets you map, you can do like slash API slash customers and have that specifically mapped to a function. So you could hide the, the, the source function URL. Um, and then you could pass values to it or whatnot. So it's a little bit prettier. Uh, and then you might want to integrate it into your application. So some examples um, is that again, you might have an app, um, whoops, that's, that's what I meant to. So you might have an app to where you go to slash customers, it's going to go to function one. You go to slash products, it automatically knows to go to function two. So it's a way for you to add friendly names. Um, future versions that are coming out that's in, in work right now is you're going to be able to do API versioning. So you're going to be able to have, if you have one version of the API and then you update it, you can go to version 2.0 and 3.0 and so on and so forth. Um, but this basically lets you map all different uh, functions to different URLs through a proxy, which is great. You can also serve up static content on proxies, which I'll demo as well, and, and so that's pretty cool. So technically, you don't even need a web server anymore to serve up if you have a very simple static website. And so this is an example. It's all configured through JSON as usual. So you have a match condition, what methods you're going to allow, in this case all of them, the route, and then that's the actual backend URL that it's going to hit. So that's hidden behind the scenes, and so your customer, whoever hits API slash the name of the function or whatnot, and then it passes all of that in. So um, in, in just a general overview then, so of why you would want to use Azure Functions, uh, event-driven scale, again, scale on demand, um, reduce time to DevOps, 
tons of languages are supported. So I only talked about Node.js and C Sharp because that seems to be the most popular. But you want to use F Sharp, you want to use PHP, you want to use uh, PowerShell scripting. You can do all of that in uh, Azure Functions, which is great. Um, and my, one of my favorite features, you can bind into all these services that we have that make it really, really simple to use. So really, really good stuff. So some best practices. I'm gonna I'm gonna go over like why. What are some signs or some best practices I might want to um, implement or, or use a, uh, a a Azure function or just a serverless model. So functions should do one thing. So when you're building a, a serverless application out or a function, you want it just to do one thing and one thing really well. And that's something I struggle with because I'm used to building these big applications. And so you do end up with multiple functions. But what's what's important about that is that they all need to be able to run independently, whether it's, you know, it's running one or a hundred of them. That's, that's the final point there. But it allows that, you know, if you chain them correctly, you know, function two, three, and four aren't going to run until, you know, one is complete. So they should just do, whoop, they should just do one thing and one thing well. They should finish as quickly as possible. So two things that are good about this. Um, kind of force you to write good code. <laughs> so your, how good you code is going to be directly influence how much you get billed. Um, uh, so, and also, as of right now, there is a timeout after five minutes on a function. And if your function's taking five minutes, it better be used to doing something pretty major for it to take that long. Um, the only one I've ever had come close to running five minutes is I was importing like thousands and thousands of rows of data for a school, and it just it was a slow SQL server and it was taken forever. So they should definitely finish as quickly as possible. They should be stateless. We're not storing state here. So something that is completely stateless. And I don't know how to pronounce that word, but basically they should, they should function the same whether one of them's firing off or a thousand of them should be the exact same result. So signs that a serverless pattern might be useful for a given scenario. So again, you have a stateless application that you need to scale way up. Uh, it's just financially not worth deploying a traditional backend. Um, so I have, so in Miami, we have what's called the Microsoft Innovation Center. And I built this little app to show slides on a screen, like TVs, just like this throughout it. And the slides change once a week, twice a week or whatnot. And so I built this little app on a Raspberry Pi that hits an API like once a day. That's not something I need to have a website up available 24 hours that I'm paying for when the slides don't change that often. So I just set up a function that hits a database behind the scenes. So literally getting billed for, you know, 30 seconds of server time every month. And it's, you know, I think it actually, it turns out to be free because it's, it's so, so low, but so not worth deploying a traditional backend and both financially and just time wise. Workload is very sporadic. So this one comes into play for, um, you know, I talked about if you have an idea and you want to build this idea, but in the past, if I had this great idea for this new app or this new website, I'd had a rent space, all this stuff. And then if it takes six months for me to get any traffic, I'm still paying all that money. So with this, it's, you know, you set it up and if someone uses it, you're spending money. If they're not great. And then, um, also if you have sporadic workloads, high and low functions can handle that. And then lots of different services that involve that need glue. So again, you're writing to uh, table storage that needs to fire off this, which needs to fire off that. So you need to chain a bunch of, of things together. Functions are perfect for that. So again, I know that was a lot of slides. I want to try to really just hammer in what functions can do, um, you know, why they're important. And uh, I'm just going to go over the tooling and then we'll get into the demos, which actually I have plenty of time, which is great. So I'll talk about the um, CLI tool. So the command line tool, I use this 99% of the time. And what this lets me do, number one, it has ASCII art. So of course it's awesome, okay? So that's number one why you should use it. But basically this is installed via an NPM package. It does not run on Mac yet. That's the only thing they're going, um, it is an issue on GitHub. I don't think they're working on it. Um, but if enough people go and upvote it, they might. But if you're on Windows, you just do npm install Azure core functions or actually Azure functions core tools. And um, it installs this npm package and it just sets up a sh uh, shortcut for FUNC. And then um, you can create new functions, you can test them locally, and it's not a simulator. That's the important thing. It's the same runtime that's running in the cloud. So um, it sets up everything on your machine. Um, you can, I talked about this before, you can invoke triggers based on events in Azure. So I could quickly on my machine go and create a blob trigger 
and then I can connect it, put a string in connecting it to a, um, a blob storage in Azure, and then I could add a file to that storage in the cloud, and it will fire on my machine, which is very cool. Uh, develop, um, install the NPM package, completely open source. Um, I am a contributor on this as well, so anyone who wants to contribute can. Uh, and then also, another great tool is you can actually create and develop and publish your Azure functions right to your Azure account. Um, Verse, uh, you know, if, if you want it. So I can literally say func Azure login, put my credentials in, and then publish the name of my app and go from there. And then vice versa, it has lots of cool tools to where I can pull down settings and keep them encrypted on my machine so I could test locally. Um, I get the full output log, which is super helpful. So I could see, you know, as I'm, again, uh, running it and debugging it, I could see the errors as they're happening. So the downside. This, you cannot debug C Sharp. You can only debug Node.js with the core tools. So um, there is a much better C Sharp debugging story, which I'll get to in a second. But so that's the downside. So, um, you know, you can't debug C Sharp. Uh, and then sometimes, like, if you're doing a lot of changes, like I was late last night working on a demo for today, and I kept saving, and it automatically restarts the host. Sometimes you have to, like, manually stop it and restart it. Not a big deal. We're developers. You know, we, we know how to do this stuff. So that's the core tools. Very, very cool. I'm in that 99% of the time. Uh, another way, if you want, you can set up and code right inside the Azure portal. Fine for some people for very quick testing. I personally don't recommend it. The only advantage of doing the um, setting up and doing this in uh, the Azure portal is when you have to set up let's say the binding to table storage or a binding to blob storage, it's kind of point and click and it sets up the connection string for you. As with, um, if you're doing it locally, it's not that much big of a deal. You have to then go and find the connection string and manually do it. So that, and, uh, but this gives you access to application insights that I talked to you about. You can manage all the application settings that are, that are encrypted, live execution log. So um, when you do end up publishing your function, it does go into the portal and you can view everything here and then you can uh, view the log happen in real time. Um, easily set up triggers and bindings, code directly in the browser. Big one, you could set up continuous deployment. So this is one I use all the time to where I, I, I link it up to a GitHub repo, a specific branch, and then every time something's checked in or merged into that repo, automatically deploys to my function and it's live, which is great. Uh, Top-down view of all functions, uh, and then you can view a full execution history. So good stuff. And then the latest, this is the C-sharp story. So this was just announced two weeks at build. So if you have Visual Studio 2017 preview installed, which you can install alongside regular VS 2017, they are separate installations now, finally, um, you have the full experience you're used to, which is full IntelliSense. I want to debug it, I hit F5. So big difference, you're developing in C-sharp classes, think of like a portable class library versus doing C-sharp script. So um, it's very, very similar. If you've ever done web jobs, it's similar to that. Meaning instead of using C-sharp script, you're doing C-sharp. There's no more function JSON this way. You're actually setting up your bindings as attributes, which I don't show here, but I'll show it in an actual demo. Um, you can right click and deploy to Azure. As of right now, Oh, sorry, let me back up before I say that. Um, and the difference when you do it this way, you get a, a, a little bit of a performance increase. So when you it, publish the other two ways, when if your function hasn't run for a while and it gets triggered, there's a cold start. So it might take a few seconds to, to fire off and run because it's compiled and being brought into memory. With this, this is pre-compiling on your machine and the DLLs are going getting uploaded. So it fires instantly. So you get a little bit of a performance boost. That being said, you cannot use continuous deployment with this method yet. They are actively working on it, that team. I was told in the next month to maybe two months that feature will be available to where you can just link up a repo, it'll kick off a build process and just upload the DLLs. I'm very excited for that because I want to switch to using Visual Studio. Um, and yeah, it's just installed via a VS extension. You can go to that link, which again, if you've missed any of this at the end, I'll have a link to this entire um, presentation. Oh, here, here are the... So instead of using the function JSON, you have um, attributes. So you have, I could have one class file, and then I could have multiple functions in one class file. So in this case, function generate card, and then I, it's a queue trigger, 
and then there are my inputs, my outputs, and then I do everything down here, and having the IntelliSense just makes everyone's life easier. And then the full debugging and everything, and it works great. And then application insights. So um, this is really cool. This basically, I mainly use it to see the performance of a function to see what the average time, and then when I make changes, if the average time goes down, I'll pull this up later when we do a demo. I'll show you real time how many requests are happening per second, how long it's taking, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I actually got through those very quick, so I'll have plenty of time. So I'm going to do some demos. Now, like any demo, like this guy here, I may fail. I'm warning you right now. Um, but I'm going to first just show you the tooling. <laughs> gets me every time. <laughs> and the fact that it happened at a Microsoft store, it just, it cracks me up. Um, so I'm going to first, um, I'm going to show you the tooling because it's very important you see the tooling and the differences between, and there's a, a good amount to cover there. <laughs> and then um, after the tooling, I'm going to do a different demo that I did. I can't pronounce the other city. I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude. Um, and I'm going to have you guys be interactive. So every single one of you I know has a cell phone. Every single one of you is on the Wi-Fi. So we're going to set up two teams, and I set up a fun demo. Thanks to this guy who inspired me. He has a serverless talk later today. So you guys are going to make sure to go to his talk. And uh, I did a, a fun little demo that I've never tested in a live environment, so it may not work. Um, but then after, I'll put up these links to actual you know, useful stuff that these are all real projects I worked on that use functions and whatnot, and you could download all the code. It's all 100% open source. So I'll put this back up in a minute. Um, so I am going to live code and do some demoing now. So give me just a second here. OK, it's duplicated already. So I'm going to start in, um, how do I want to do this? I'm going to start in the portal. So how many people here are currently using Azure? Anyone in here using Azure? A few? OK. Very quick primer, Azure is our cloud. Um, we focus a lot on the developer tools. Um, it is, you know, we have, I think it's, we have 38 regions around the world. We're larger than AWS and Google combined. But our big thing that we focus on are developers. You're our, you're our bread and butter. We know that. Um, and we want to make things super, super simple for you to do so that, again, you could focus on coding, writing your stuff, not managing a full infrastructure. So this here is my Azure dashboard, OK? Um, sorry, hold on. There we go. Um, OK, so when I log in and you customize it, so I have these resource groups, resource just link linked resources together. So for example, all the demos I did for Code Europe I have in this resource group. When I fly back home, you know, and I, I don't have to sit there and find every, like, you know, all of 30 things and delete them. I just delete the resource group. Everything linked gets deleted. Um, in addition, uh, at the end of the month, I could see how much I specifically was billed towards um, my Code Europe trip. You have the health of all the different regions. So I said, like I said, we're in 38 regions right now around the world. So if there is an issue, it will show up here. And then you can customize it. You could put videos. You could put anything you want. In this case, like back home, it's 8.48 AM. Um, I just have a timer here. And then if I want to create something, I can just go to New. Um, I could type it in right here. So in this case, I could type Function App. And it was, you saw it was coming up. Uh, or I can scroll down, and I can go to web and mobile, um, web app, logic, whatever I want. So it's, we try to make it as easy to use as possible. So, so I'm going to create a brand new function app just to kind of show you the tooling. And then later, we're going to dive into more on the demo on this. But So if I want to create a function app, I just choose it. I hit Create. OK, and I'll say code, oops. Europe demo two, and then oh, demo two. Okay, and it, it in real time checks to see if that you, uh, is available. So the consumption plan for the, the hosting plan that's an important part. So I talked about how there's auto scaling. The other side of that is if you don't want it to auto scale, you can assign a fixed set of resources. Some companies want to know that they're spending exactly 180 bucks a month on a. Um, it's technically a virtual machine behind the scenes that's running the runtime, so you can get a prefixed. Um, a preset amount of performance if you want, but then, you, then you're then you not taking advantage of the billing model. So I, I do bring that up every time. Um, so the cons so consumption plan, which it defaults, I don't want it in the South Central US. I'll do uh, North Europe, which is fine, whatever. And then it automatically sets up a storage account. So I hit Create. And then literally, depending on the time of day, the alignment of the sun and the moon, you know, the temperature outside, how much coffee you had, this could take 
30 seconds, anywhere up to like two minutes. It, it really just depends on how many deployments are ahead of you. It usually is, is under a minute. And then once it's done, I already have some that are set up in here. It will set up a function app, and it'll look like this. So this is a little function logo. And so let me go to Code Europe Demos. And actually, that's a bad example. Let me give me one second. Let me go to actually go to another resource group that has a lot of. Uh, hold on, give me one second. Okay, yeah, I'll just I'll actually go to what I demoed in the Costa Farms, the IoT one. So here, let me go into the functions here. So then, once they get deployed. Okay, so see, it took about a minute there for me to deploy a brand new one. So once it gets deployed, you basically get a top-down view of all your functions. And this is going to take a second to load. It does, it does depend on the actual internet connection. But when this gets done loading, I'll actually see the... So here we go. I have an alert function. I have an alert function in, in JavaScript because I did both. And then I just have a general HTTP trigger that, you know, I fire off just to test it. So here's for that Costa Farms demo I was talking about earlier. I just have my C sharp trigger, and this is all the code that runs. So I'm bringing in an event hub message. Um, I'm deserializing it. I'm making a message, and I'm sending it out to Twilio. And that's all that does when it runs. And if I go to the logs, um, actually, they're not going to show because I, um, I did this earlier today. But I can go to monitor, and it should show the last few times that I ran this uh, earlier today. And again, it is highly dependent on, on your connection. So I hey got to do it right. Um, so here, so on average, this was taken a bit long, 922 milliseconds, 800 is over a second. So it's not very efficient, this, this function. I could probably make it a bit faster, but I can actually look at the history of the results. And then if I want to, um, so here's what was actually sent. And if I wanted to change the code, I can just click on it and change the code right here. And if I was deploying from GitHub, it wouldn't let me change the code here. I have to then deploy from GitHub. Um, if I want to manage the application settings, I just click on it up here, go to platform features, and I go to application settings. So these are my hidden settings. Of course, I don't want to store Twitter authentication keys, Twitter, um, Twilio authentication key keys in my GitHub. So I do it as an application setting, and there are the keys and everything that I have right there. So that's kind of a very high-level version of the portal. Very powerful. I usually use it once my app has been deployed or function's been deployed, or um, to test, if I need to really rapidly test something, I just spin this up, I, I put the code right in, um, and if I want to create a new function, I'll just show you that real quick. So I hit plus, and then you have all your different templates. So in this case, I'll say C sharp, and I want an HTTP trigger, and if I scroll down, I'll name my function uh, code your, oh, sorry, I can't do a dash, code Europe HTTP, and then it's going to generate a key so I can authorize the function level. And there, it's done. So it's literally done. And if I copy this URL, oh, it takes a second. Give me a second here. Come on. There we go. Whoop. So now I have a custom URL. And if I copy this, let me paste this guy. And it should return back saying, uh, please pass in a name or string or a name in the query. So right there, it's, so that's what's doing. If you look right here, it shows it logs the request right there. So now I just go and I do and name equals Joe. Hello, Joe. And that's all it's meant to do. So right there, and then it'll log right there that it ran again. So real simple. So um, that's the portal. So the next tool I'll show you, which is the one I use 99% of the time, is not this one. Oh, yeah, it is this one. Okay, I'm sorry. And Okay, um, let me change something because that background's coming through. I'll do this from a different command prompt. Okay, much better. Um, so I go to code and then uh, cd, what was it, code? I'll just make a new one. Uh, make directory code func, whatever. CD code func. Okay, so um, to use the command line tools, I just type func just to kind of see what my options are again, ASCII art, so you have to install it. 
but I could I can authenticate to my Azure account. I can pull settings down. I can create new ones. So let's do the exact same thing I just did in the portal. Okay. So in this case, I would say I have to start because I'm starting a brand new function app. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that you can host multiple function apps under functions under one function app, kind of like what I just showed you, Acosta. So we have to initialize that setup first. So I just say func init. What this does is it sets up a git ignore file. Uh, it sets up a host JSON in your local settings or whatnot, and then a launch JSON, just the, the standard files you need. And then I just say func new. Okay, and then um, I choose whatever language I want. So in this case, I'm going to say C sharp, and I will do a HTTP trigger, and then I'm going to leave the default name, and then it's there. So everything is there, all the same code, and I just say code. I open up Visual Studio Code, which I use, and there's – oops, let me increase the font size. So there's all the exact same files you saw on the portal. So there's my function JSON, which is the trigger. Um, there's my run.csx, the exact same code. And then um, if I had settings, I ha would have them in here. But then to run it, I just say func host start. I'm going to go through the, the other tooling a little quick because I want to get to the demo. I know we're, um, we have, what, till 310, right? Till so another 15 minutes? Okay, so I, I guess I'm good. But I just, did, I just did func host start. This uses the exact same runtime. And now this is running on my machine, and I know it's hard to read, but if you look at the bottom here, that URL is where that same um, the function is running. So I'm going to copy this, and it's running on my local machine. And just like before, same thing. And this is pulling from my local machine. And if I uh, go here and I say uh, question mark name equals Joe, hello, Joe, and then just to show you how it compiles in real time, I can say... Hello, my awesome coder friend. Save that. And when I save it, if I go back to the command prompt, it, it says compilation. It's, um, oh, yeah, script for function trigger C sharp changed, reloading, compilation succeeded. So as you're making changes, it automatically watches the file and recompiles. So if I go back here and I refresh it, hello, my awesome coder or code friend, Joe. Okay, so that's the local one. So the local one too, I could literally spend an hour just talking about that one, but you can authenticate to your Azure account, pull down settings, create new ones, publish new ones. I use that one the most and I do 99% of my development in VS Code. Then finally, Visual Studio, which if you're a C-sharp developer, hopefully you know and love Visual Studio. Um, this is the preview one. And then I meant to preload. Um, so once you install the... Um, once you install the, uh, the extension, you can just do file new Azure function project the same way you would do a web API, app project, whatever you want. It works exactly the same. Um, and then the difference is what we talked about to where I just have this one class file right here, which I know it's hard to read. And then inside of there, I have all my separate functions. So in this case, it is I have a generate card. I have a request image processing. I have a settings. And then... If I want to debug it, when I hit F5, it compiles it and it uses that exact same CLI tool that I showed you before and it just references that DLL and it works the same way. So I'll hit F5. Should build. No, I'm not going to install a new one right in the middle of the demo. I guess there's an update. Not that stupid. And then you'll see this all looks familiar. This will pop up. Uh, oh, I have the other one running. Let me... Uh, let me stop the other demo. Okay, let's try this one more. Well, before I do that too, the only other thing too like I talked about before, this is similar to web jobs. There are There is no function JSON, so all my bindings are right here. So I'm binding this to a queue and so on and so forth, but let me hit F5. So this one in this case is a couple APIs. This one, it's called the coder cards demo. It's up there. I'm not going to do this demo today, but basically you upload an image of someone's face, give them a name and a title. It takes them, looks at their emotion, and then makes like almost like a badge. It's, it's pretty cool, and it's, it's a great um, demonstration of all the technologies. So I'll just call the settings API just to show you how the debug works. So I'm going to call an API just like I did before from the URL they gave me. And you see, boom, I have full... Just like regular F10, I can go through, debug, and it works phenomenal, which is great. So 
This was a long time coming. Um, once for me, once they uh, implement the ability to do continuous deployment, I will be switching to using this because I love using Visual Studio and debugging can be kind of a pain. Um, and then let me just hit F5 to hit continue. So this the request went through and there are my settings that came through for this app. Okay, perfect. So we have 10 minutes left. That should be enough for me to do the demo and also answer some questions. So I'm gonna go here real quick, quick, okay. So, I'm sorry, I don't, I know your last name. I don't know how to pronounce your first name. What is your first name? Yes, that's his first name. He has a talk at what, 525 on service or 5, 510? Okay, so definitely go to his talk. He was showing me this cool demo. They built this like cool little tank game um, on serverless or whatnot. I'm like, okay, I want to do something that's kind of interactive um, that uses serverless to where, um, there we go, so it's working now, uh, to where I can, um, get the room involved. So I just built this literally last night. We had our little um, uh, dinner, speaker dinner, and I was sitting there just coding, drinking beer, and then I just finished it in the lunchroom like an hour ago, just put a couple hours into it. And all this is going to do is that I'm going to have this side be team one, this side be team two, and it just demonstrates, I'm going to give you a link to go to, and you'll see a button for team one or team two, just hit whatever team, and I want you guys to keep hitting it as much as you can, and it's just to show that, that it can handle the scale, hopefully, we don't know, it may crash, and then based on, as the, the, the requests go up, it should start moving in one direction or the other. Is this going to work? I have no idea, but we're going to try it right now. So don't hit any of the buttons yet. You can go to the URL, but the URL for you to go to is... Bear with me. I've got to find my PowerPoint again. That's it right there. aka.ms slash az tug of war. But don't hit any buttons yet because you'll, you'll, you'll ruin everything. And I'm going to go to the URL myself, make sure it works. Okay, it's, it's coming up. And I've only tested this with two people, not like whatever, 30, 40 people that we have here. So aka.ms slash az tug of war. And you should just get Azure Functions tug of war and a green button and a blue button. So again, this side, my, to my right, is team one, which will be the green button. And over here, you guys are all team two. Okay, yeah, I, I want to see every one of you going to this. That's right, I'm not leaving until, okay. So you guys had enough time to get to the link. Okay, so now, oh, look at this. You guys are ready, you're cheating. You're cheating, but it's working. Okay, I'm going to reset it real quick. Just bear with me, I'm going to reset it. And then, seriously, don't hit the button. It's always one guy in the audience. And I want to try, I want to see, um, give me one second. So resource groups, uh, give me a second. Code. I don't have a way as of right now to um, reset the scores. I have to manually go into document DB and do this. But this just shows, so document DB, for those who don't use it, it's no SQL. It just stores it as JSON objects and it's lightning fast and literally global scalable. So I just have two records with each team in there and then I have two records with for one for each team. I thought I did. Come on, there they are. And I'm just going to go in and manually set them to zero. So let me save that. Because someone couldn't wait. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know who you are. Okay, and then let me go back here. Let me refresh this. Make sure this still works. Might have crashed my browser. Give me a second. Let me... Close this. Let me close. I have too much open here. So this is also using those proxies. So I just have this all in blob storage. There's no web server. So what it's doing, it's not the cleanest of code, but it's using jQuery and every half a second, it's hitting the API. And again, I guess it's taken a second with the, the Wi-Fi because we're all on it now, but being it hasn't hit yet, was working. Come on. One more time. Well, while it's doing that, let me go back to um, my portal and go to the application insights and we can see what's going on here. So if I go back to code Europe demos, I did set up application insights. Or it might be scaling up for a second there. Maybe that's why I'm getting a delay. And so this is like a live stream of what's going on. So, um, okay, so we're not getting any requests. Good. Oh, come on, demo. Man, was working. 
We'll try. I'll, let me just try um, doing an edge. I'll just see if it makes any difference. And if not, I'll, let me restart it. We'll see. Oh, what's going on? No. Okay. Well, I promise you it worked. I let me uh, let me just restart the app one more time because this would have been really cool. I blame you guys that cheated. Okay. Let me um, let me restart it real quick, and we'll just try that. Uh, so code Europe tug of war. And then I'm going to restart the application. OK. Did that. Service unavailable. That's good. Give me one second. So while this is um, hopefully going to work, we'll see. Um, any questions? that I can answer. Yes? Right. So you, there's a couple different ways to do security right now. Um, you can authenticate the function just with a key, standard. Um, you can uh, integrate with Azure AAD. Um, and then you can integrate with, because uh, it's basically a web app under the hood, so you can integrate with like Facebook and Twitter. Um, there is no perfect authentication story yet because again, it's, um, it's for small functions. You really would just probably store a key and then authenticate with that key against the function. So anyway, I don't know, I, I'm gonna blame the Wi-Fi because it was, it was working. I don't know why um, it's not working now, but basically I was gonna have you guys, as you, huh? Okay, let me try that real quick. Oh yeah, network. Yeah, it's uh, it's waiting for it to come back. So let me let me do this. Let me let, let me get it working first. Here, I got one more thing I can try because I do want to do this demo. Okay, I'm going to platform. Uh, one second, all settings. So if we go to all settings, and then I'm gonna stop it completely. Yes, stops very quick. And I'm gonna restart it. And then while it's doing that, let me actually put up the link, uh, my contact information just for a second. So everything you've seen here today, this entire slide deck is at that slideshare.net slash Joe Rayo. I encourage you, you know, follow me on Twitter, email me. I'm, I'm bad at email or follow me on, on GitHub. All my projects I put on GitHub. Um, and then, um, you know, if questions, you can tweet at me or just say, hey, Joe, your demo sucked, whatever. I don't care. It's cool. Um, but yeah, but everything you saw here, I will have up on that, um, on that slide share so that, so that you have it. I think it's just, it'll say code Europe dash Azure functions. So let me see if this, okay, so it started. Let me see if I can get the API to work. Wondering if I hit a limit or I set something up wrong. Anyway, so I tried and I failed. But, okay, there we go. So hold on. Ah, mm, that's okay. But it doesn't matter. We're getting a result. I don't care. We're going to try this. So if you guys have it up on your phone, start hitting buttons. Go for it. And you should see, see they're, they're rising. So I'm going to go to team two because team two needs help. And it locked up. Oh, well. So we tried it. So I, I'll learn from this. I'll try to figure out what happened. But basically, when I tested it with just two people, we, we had it to where it was like increasing and then it moved over. Um, maybe I have to set it instead of pulling it every half a second, have it pull every one second. Um, so uh, there's a million things. But either way, it's a pretty cool demo. My, the code for this is all on my GitHub page. You can look at it, make fun of my code, and say, oh, Joe, this is what's happened. You know, that'd be cool too. So that being said, um, I want to thank you guys so much. It was an honor to be able to come here and speak. I really, really appreciate it. I had a great time hanging out here in Poland. I hope to be back here next year and enjoy the rest of your conference. And go see this guy's thing at 525. He's doing another thing too. So thank you.